So there's a real art and there's a strategy in allowing distractions to, to not last forever, to reconnect with the original purpose. And that applies to a whole lot more than just simply trying to get something or find something in a room. It applies to your life. It applies to the reason why God created us to come here in the first place, and that is to connect with Him and to get to know Him. The last couple of weeks I've been reading a very thick theological kind of a book. It's actually a PhD dissertation that made it into print. And the end of the introduction is probably the best sentence of the entire book in my estimate. And the author, Richard Hayes, he says, I've grown increasingly convinced that the struggles of the church in our time is the result of us losing, our, losing touch with our own gospel story and we're off message. And we've lost our way in a culture that's telling many other stories about uh, who we are and, and where our hope lies. Could it be that we in life have forgotten why we are here in the first place? Because we're, con we're distracted and we're bombarded by all kinds of other voices. And sometimes those distractions, they, they get us off message and the distractions will only last a short period of time, a short season. But other times, those distractions can keep you off message for years. A day or two ago, I went to seminary. Back when I had hair and it was a different color than it is right now. And I studied scripture. I mean, that was my full-time job just studying the scriptures, and I could not escape the conviction that prayer was a very big deal to Jesus and to his followers and to the prophets who came before him. And so I spent the first nine years of my ministry when Trish and I were in a little church in Tennessee. My prayer life reflected that conviction. I had, I, I had a very serious prayer life. And then we get called to a, a larger church uh, in the northern part of our state, and it had a lot of greater demands on my time. And instead of, of taking those demands and driving me even more to my knees, I allowed them to distract me from that prayer life. And that distraction really lasted for quite a number of years. The prayer life that I'd had for the last number of years was nothing compared to what it had been. So the prayer had really slipped from the front burner, kind of like to the back burner. It wasn't off the stove entirely. Otherwise, you better get a new preacher. But is it just me or is it ridiculously easy to get distracted from prayer? I think it's, a, it's pretty universal. And, and, the, and the result is that, that prayer ends up becoming a spare tire instead of a steering wheel. You know, a spare tire, when do you only use the spare tire? When there's an emergency. You know, is that the only time we use prayer? When there's an emergency. There's a health emergency. There's a relational emergency. So we, we, we drag out prayer at that time. Or is prayer the steering wheel that really is, is emblematic of, of, of deciding where it is that we go with our life? Well, if the spare tire is really more a description of prayer in your life than the steering wheel, then I want to help you de develop the fine art of getting back, doing a U-turn, getting back to prayer of closing the gap between the kind of praying we see in Jesus and the apostles and our kind of praying. And quite frankly, that's been one of the greatest joys of my life here in Idlewild that I, I've been able to get back. The joy and the deep communion with God that I've known in the past. So what's my word for the year? It's fresh, fresh, fresh. And that, that's a, an apt description of, of my prayer life. So we saw last week that the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to a group of Christians in the city of Ephesus, and he's about to pray for them in the beginning of chapter 3 when he gets diverted. Hey, the Apostle Paul can get diverted from prayer, but it doesn't take him nearly as long to get back to it. The diversion only lasts for 13 verses, and he quickly gets back on point, and we're going to dive into that prayer that he prays beginning with verse 16 or 15. But before we actually dive into the prayer, just one additional observation um, about praying. Uh, I was thinking about this, this message 
uh, I've been thinking about it for quite some time. And if you are preaching on a Sunday, um, there's a, an older minister who, who called it feeding the beast, that the sermon is the beast that con- needs constant feeding. And, and so much of my mind and my, my thoughts uh, at all times of day is concerning the time that we spend here. So it's Thursday morning, this last Thursday, 2.30 in the morning, I awaken for no great reason other than maybe the Holy Spirit was nudging me. And so, you know, I begin to pray about comments for this morning. And then I can't go back to sleep, so I get up and I, I make my prayer life a little bit more formal, spend some time there, and then I, I go and I exercise. And while I exercise, I was listening to sermons. Uh, it some people call it a disease. I call it a joy, you know, to actually listen, look forward to listening to preachers. Well, I'm listening to a sermon from John Ortberg, who is the, uh, an eco-pastor uh, in Menlo Park. And I've made a reference to him before, but he was preaching on prayer. So I saw, hey, this, is, this ought to be good. And he's saying, uh, listen, we need to just ditch the lame excuses that we tolerate to live mediocre spiritual lives. So he says, just ditch the the lame excuses that we make for prayer. What are they? Okay, I don't have time. I'm not good at it. I tried to pray before and nothing happened, so it probably doesn't work. Uh, My mind wanders when I pray. Uh, If I try to pray a formula, it sounds so mechanical, but if I try to go freestyle, it sounds so confused. You know, I fall asleep when I pray. I'm afraid that if I prayed, God might actually answer it and he would change me and I don't want to change. You know, uh, I did something bad last night, and so I'm now in a spiritual timeout. I'm too extroverted to pray. I'm too introverted to pray. Uh, The dog ate my prayer list. You know, I mean, just the number of excuses that we make. uh, Paul makes none of them. Makes none of them, although he could. We're going to begin looking at his, his, his prayer. He begins it, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. And he's launching into this prayer. But remember the circumstances that we talked about last week? He's chained between two Roman soldiers in house arrest. Not exactly circumstances that I would call conducive to great praying. But he launches into this majestic prayer for you, for me, for the Ephesian believers. And given his circumstances, it's very interesting what is not on his prayer list. He does not pray Lord, use your almighty power to free me from this situation so that I can go into new places and preach the gospel. He does not pray that. You would think he would. And if I was in his situation, that's probably what I would be praying. Well, what does make it on our prayer list? When you pray, what do you pray about? Guidance, provision, provision, protection, deliverance, success, forgiveness, Jesus taught us to pray for these kind of things. Uh, When he teaches us to pray the Lord's Prayer that we prayed this morning, give us our daily bread, forgive us debts, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. And if you just focus on the verbs that Jesus is telling us to use when we pray, they are give me, forgive me, forgive me, uh, lead me and deliver me. So Jesus is inviting us, indeed commanding us, to pray these kind of requests. But there's something that he tells us to pray first before the give me, lead me, forgive me type of prayers. And that is, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That comes first. So if we go straight to the give me, forgive me, lead me, um, and deliver me kind of prayers, and we park ourselves there, we're going to end up with a very sedate, uh, mediocre life, spiritually, that will only be punctuated occasionally by glimmers of glory, no, if, if you pray the order that Jesus tells us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. First, you pray God's agenda. Where do you think your life might end up? Well, that's what Paul is wanting us to discover. See, Paul had experienced firsthand Christians and churches that had God's will and God's kingdom up first And they were joyful, and they were buoyant, and there was an expansive power among those Christians. 
Uh, and the air around them, when they gathered together, was electric with, with transformation. And there was just this contagion of enthusiasm for God. And Paul has also been around and experienced firsthand Christians and churches that were stuck and mired in religious rule-keeping and human agendas where prayer never went beyond the give me, forgive me, lead me, deliver me level, and the atmosphere in those churches and those Christians, well, they just say it was stagnant. Not a whole lot going on. So Paul is basically introducing his prayer by saying that's no way to live your one and only life. So he launches into what he is praying for them. And it begins in verse 16. There are four things that Paul prays for the Ephesians and, and that he's praying for you and for me. And so these are prayers that God yearns to have uh, applied in your life. And that these are four great prayers that you should put on your prayer list. That first of all, Paul prays that according to the Father's glorious riches, he would strengthen us with power through his Spirit in the inner person. And the second request is given that, so that Christ would live in us profoundly. And then a third request, that the power to grasp the length, the height, the width, and the depth of Christ's love would be given to us. And then finally, that we would be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now there's so much packed into that short prayer that I'm going to divide it up and take the second two requests next week. We're just going to look at the first two to conclude today. Paul says, I pray, verse 16, according to the riches of God's glory that he would strengthen you with power. I pray according to God's riches. Now, if I'm Bill Gates and I give you a $100 bill, I'm giving you some money out of my riches. But if I'm Bill Gates and I give you $100 billion, I'm giving you according to my riches. Paul is praying that we would receive according to the riches of God. So basically, he's praying this audacious prayer that um, the amount of strengthening power that would be coming to us would be just mind-blowing. And the, the focus isn't that God would change my circumstances around me. This focus is that he would change me. I pray according to the riches of his glory that he would strengthen you with power through his spirit in the inner man. That's the focus that the inner person be what has changed, that we would have strength to be able to bear suffering, that we'd have strength to be able to endure conflict, that we'd have strength to be able to face temptation, that we'd have strength uh, to serve God as we ought. That kind of strength, that's what Paul is praying. And he's praying that that leads into the second request. He says, so that Christ may dwell in us profoundly, transformatively, Dwell in us by faith. Now, that word dwell, Paul could have used two different Greek words. Both Greek words are actually a combination, uh, a scrunching together of two original words. Uh, uh, oikos is, is, what, is the word for house. And if you put one uh, kata, kata oikos, with that, you're talking about somebody's dwelling, but they're only dwelling as a temporary resident. Sort of like, you know, when you go into a hotel. You're dwelling there, but just it, the intention is for a, a limited amount of time. But if you take kata away and you put a, a, a different uh, pronoun with that, it's the, the, word, the pro, uh, pronoun uh, para, it means you're dwelling permanently. Guess which one Paul is asking? That, that Jesus would dwell in our hearts? Sort of temporarily and fleetingly? No, it's the word permanently. Now, if you're a guest, a, permanent, a temporary guest in my house, there are certain parts of my house that you will not see. My wife will close the laundry room doors. There are certain closets that are off limits to you. You will not go traipsing through my bedroom, and you will not know where the plunger is. Okay? But if you are a permanent resident of my house, you have full access to all areas of my house. In other words, you have the master key, and you can go anywhere. That's what Paul's praying. Paul is praying that Jesus would be the permanent resident of our hearts, that we would give him the master key. So wherever it is that you want to go, Jesus, 
Nothing is off limits to you in my life. Every room you have free reign. So Jesus, come on into the kitchen, which means that you are Lord of what I eat, how much I eat, and what I eat. Lord, you are Lord of the computer room and my viewing patterns. You are Lord of the bedroom and how I express my sexuality. You are Lord of the closets, of all the things that I try to have done in the past that I try to keep uh, away from everyone. You are the Lord of those places as well. And I think of all the sights on God's green earth, is there any sadder sight than a person who only gives Jesus partial access within? They restrict him. They withhold him. Maybe a key to get in the front door, but the entryway, that's where it stops. No master key is given. That lips that proclaim Jesus as Savior and Lord, well, Jesus, can he save something if you're not willing to give it to him and let it go? And is he Lord of all or is he Lord at all? Which is it? So Paul is praying, and he's praying for, for people who have already let Jesus in the front door. These are Christians to whom he's praying for. It's not those who are outside. And he's praying that Christ would dwell in your hearts as a permanent resident by faith and that that interior connection with Jesus would just go deeper and deeper and deeper. 37 years, 6 months, and 17 days ago, Trish and I exchanged our wedding vows and our rings. And about an hour after we did that, we cut the cake, okay? And I'm going to ask you, how married was I when I was cutting the cake? Sort of married? No. Legally, we were fully married. But as the, the years have passed, my wife and I have spent close to a third of a million hours of life together. And that would qualify us to be in the fourth quarter, perhaps. We've gone through all kinds of seasons together. Uh, would it be correct to say that we're actually more married now than we were then? Legally, no. Same. But in reality, it's so much deeper. It's so much deeper. Ironically, <laughs> this past week, our marital status was thrown into a little bit of limbo when we went searching through every important document that we have to try to find the necessary documentation for Trish to get a real license, okay? You know, one of those, you know, you need, you know, it's kind of like saw your right arm and get off, say, yeah, that's my DNA, so give me a license. Um, we found that we don't have a marriage license, like a, an official one, you know? And so um, we've assumed that the minister mailed in the license, but we don't know that for a fact yet. So Trish is sort of rehearsing what she's going to say to the kids, if, if indeed. But, but I'm okay with all of this. You know why? Because if it comes to find out that we don't have a, a wedding license, that means that we need to get married again. And I'm okay with that because what happens after the wedding? What happens after the cake? Another third of a million hours. That's what I'm thinking about. I don't, don't know what you were thinking about. Okay, oh, that's all the diversion. Back to the main point here. Jesus, in the lives of those who've led him in the front door, but led him in deeper. That's what Paul's praying for, a deeper connection with the one who created you, a richer relationship with Christ where your life is different and it's impacted where you, you find yourself giving priority to God's will and God's agenda in prayer before your own. Before your own, give me, forgive me, lead me, and deliver me prayers. Where you find Christ just settling into deeper regions of your interior and he's bringing his light and his life and his healing to those areas. And your connection with him, it has you thinking differently than you used to. It has you speaking differently so that gossip and criticism is not your mother tongue anymore. It has your thought life. It may not be perfect, but it's different. 
And your relationship to money has changed. No longer is it your money. You're a trustee and a steward of that which God has given you. It's a tool, not an idol. And you also find yourself venturing to share your relationship with Christ with other people whenever the Holy Spirit is nudging you to do that. And you find when you let Jesus in deeper that it's just a joy to give him the very first thought of the day, the very first thing that you think about. And you give him uh, the first day of each week, the, the Sunday, the Sabbath. And you give him the first 10% of, of every paycheck, joyfully. It's his. And you know he'll just simply be your provider in ways that you would never know otherwise. And that you would give him first consideration in every decision. That's, that's what it's like to give Jesus the master key. First consideration in every decision. And all of us you freely give to your Lord and Savior, who is indeed, in fact, not just in name, my Lord and my Savior. That's just the first half of Paul's prayer. you got to come again next week to find the second half. And it's great. Okay, let's pray. Lord, what a joy that you invite us to pray. What a privilege it is that the creator of the universe and the one who has fashioned and shaped and maintains me with thousands of, of interacting kinds of, of systems within my body, that you invite me to pray that you would have the master key. You invite us to pray, Lord Jesus, that you would come and you would be the Lord of our lives, that you know better than we do how life is lived beautifully and masterfully. And you will give us strength, Lord, and strength to be able to face challenges and, and sufferings and critique or criticism. Uh, you'll give us the strength to be able to see how you see as we give you the master key of our lives. So, Lord, we, we pray right now that you would come and be the permanent resident in these hearts. And every room that's been mentioned, we give you free reign. You are Lord of this house. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that our lives would shine in such a way through your lordship of, that's expressed in our words and our thoughts and our actions and our relationships that you'd be the one ultimately receiving glory, but we'd get the benefit of the joy. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.